have tried to kind of keep an sort of a Nebraska all-star lineup going here for in terms of presenters for the math teacher circle. So, um, and we've had some really good ones so far and we know that Shelby will uh, share some very useful information for us as well. All right, thanks Michelle, I appreciate it. You know, thanks to both Michelle and Stephanie for putting this together. It's a lot of work behind the scenes for them. Um, we wanna make sure that we're sharing best practices, you know, far and wide. And so I've assembled a collection of documents tonight that if you're in the position where you're like me, you're busy and have to cut out for various things like your own kiddos or uh, sub-district basketball or whatever it is, you know, hopefully these resources, if you take one thing tonight, well then that's how it should be effective. So I'm gonna share uh, my screen with you. And I've got things organized in a Google Doc, things organized in a Padlet. Um, I'll go through this presentations, you know, slides, or whatever. Um, all of these links that I'm going to show you and open at various points tonight are all on one sheet, and that's all featured on this Padlet. So if you're the type of person, if you're like me, I get distracted during PD really easily. I like to go off my own tangent. So if you're like me and you want to go out and start running plan problems, um, this Padlet, and, and Steph, if you can put the link in the chat box for me. Um, the first Google Doc has all the links to the different sheets. I've got some examples from Graspable Math, Desmos GeoGebra, a couple other sources. Uh, if you scroll across here, here's all the problems we're doing tonight. And so during this session, it would be super cool if any of you are, are like me and you like just working stuff while you listen. Uh, you can scroll through here, pick a problem. And if you've never used Padlet before, you can actually hit this little plus button. You can add content here. You can upload a link. So if you make something in Desmos, GeoGebra, you have a handwritten thing, like take a picture of that, would be fantastic. And we'll have this kind of art gallery of things. You know, so if you're using this, um, if you're using this recording later, you can still, the Padlet will still be live. So if you want to post your stuff on here for later, it'd be really cool if we had um, a collection of ideas from different places around the state. So I can send this back with my kids and say, hey, look what this teacher did in this town or whatnot. So that'd be great if you could do that. Um, I'll go ahead and start the presentation. Um, so again, my name is Shelby Auberg. This is my 15th year at Scottsville High School. I was at Omaha Westside for two years prior. I uh, got a lot of stuff, um, a lot of recognition for good teaching, but really that's the result of having great students and kids that are willing to work hard. So the session outline is listed on the Padlet, and I want to go through a couple of things. Um, we're going to lead off by talking about factoring as it relates to skip counting. And you know, I was hoping to see a lot of elementary presence here tonight. I did see a couple of elementary teachers, but we want to start with skip counting because that's kind of the genesis of a lot of the issues related to and surrounding factoring in algebra. Um, we'll talk later about the adjective noun model. Uh, so this idea that really struck me from elementary school that makes a lot of sense. It helps us understand combining like terms. Um, there's not enough emphasis, especially at the high school level on uh, greatest common divisor and least common multiple reasoning. So we're going to delve into a couple of problems related to that. Um, I'm going to share some things that we, we have used in our own PLC here at Scottsville High School uh, that we're really emphasizing with our kids in terms of language, in terms of the way we work problems, and how we sh show certain things, and how we try to minimize the amount of words we're interjecting into those conversations. Then we're going to take a vertical view. So a lot of times, um, you know, today was my light day. I have no planning period every other day with block schedule thanks to COVID. Uh, so today I had accelerated algebra two and geometry, pre-calc trig, my math contest class, and uh, math counts practice after school. Tomorrow's my light day with Cal Calc BC and stats. Um, so we're gonna take a vertical view. We're gonna look at how problems in calculus are informed by problems all the way down to the algebra one level and what we like to see emphasized in terms of language and process. Um, simplify is a loaded word. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that at the end. And if we have time, we'll get to a problem on thirds. Um, and simplifying radicals. So the first thing I wanted to share with you is a problem from tonight's math counts practice. So to set the scene, I had 20 kiddos in here after school for various reasons. Um, they're all working problems. And right now, a kid either qualified for math counts chapter invite, which is a qualifier for state, or they're working on video projects. And so one of my sixth grade groups is asking me about um, this problem they found in a book that says, what is the height of a stop sign uh, with side lengths of one foot? And so these are sixth graders who haven't had you know, any, much exposure at all to radicals. And you know, here they are trying to figure out how tall the stop sign is when you cut it, when you chop away these right isosceles triangles. Um, so 
we're going through this problem and talking about, you know, what we've cut away and kind of get them through this idea of rationalize the denominator and they survive that. So then we say, well, well, the height of this would be the sum of these three side lengths. And they were completely and utterly stuck and didn't know quite what to do um, because without that algebraic experience, they're not sure. So I've got on my back board over there on the big dry race board. Um, so what I did was actually something I'd like to emphasize tonight, uh, the idea of combining like terms. So what is combining like terms? Um, what's, the, what's the focus here? Well, I'm gonna attack these two terms. And I'm gonna say, all right, I don't know how to add these things. I've never seen them before, but I know that factoring is division and I can use the distributive rule. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna say, okay, what if I ran the distributive rule in reverse because these match? Well, factoring is division, so I could rewrite this as, and I notice the ratio of a number itself is one. And I pose it to them just like that without saying anything. And, and naturally they use the grouping symbols here, got to a two, and then got stuck again because they haven't had much experience multiplying fractions. They actually have, it's just they were kind of blinded by the problem. So we have this situation here. We said, how do you multiply fractions? We multiply straight across, tops and bottoms, numerator, denominator. And then we talked about ratio of a number that itself is one. And so then that helped them arrive at this idea. And then our check for understanding was at the end, I said, all right, look here. You just combine like terms. Doesn't it make sense that if you had a half a root two and a half a root two, that would combine to give a whole root two. So this was, this was the perfect segue uh, into what we were speaking about tonight. With you. Um, and now I have two problems for your consideration. So I want you to chew on each of these problems uh, for just a moment. So I'll read the first. Uh, three committees met today. One meets every seven days, another meets every 15 days, last meets every six days. How many same day meetings will there be in the following year? Um, that problem comes to us from Colorado State University Math Day. It's a bowl question. Um, and then the second problem is taken off of Art of Problem Solving Alchemist. Um, subtract the number of positive multiples of three that are less than 20 from the number of positive multiples of six that are less than 20. You know, so intended audience for the first one would be a variety of audiences, middle school, high school. Um, example two, I'd really want you to think about how would you teach that to a sixth grader or a seventh grader, you know, where there's some reading challenges there as well. So we'll pause here for just a minute while I get organized, give you a moment to chew on those, and I'll show you some things that I did on Desmos um, to address each of these questions. Let's see. So on this problem with the committees, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of our NCTM resources. So when we're running PLCs, things like principles to actions and the newest uh, interpretation, catalyzing change. And the one thing that's featured in catalyzing change is this notion of a common math pathway for kids through school, yeah. regardless of the level. What's that? I couldn't hear that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So, um, catalyzing change talks about a common math pathway through school in terms of what courses kids take, and there's a, a real emphasis on um, on spreadsheet based logic and reasoning. So if we just opened up a, a Google Sheet and talked about how a kid might address this with spreadsheet and logic, um, 
you know, all I have here is a count by seven list, a count by 15 list, and a count by six list. And then we can do this problem brute force. You know, I can use the fill handle, drag this down and get a whole litany of values. But then the question becomes, you know, how does a kid determine what the correct value is? Yeah, it might appear in all three lists, but does it matter the ordinality in which the, the value appears? Um, another thing that you might try with a kid would be to make a Desmos sheet. So here I have a table of values with a counting variable X sub one. Um, and again, these links are all on that document. So if you want to play with them at your discretion, you're free to do that. Um, so I've made these lists and then we know that uh, the prime factorization of six, 15 and seven would give us um, the least common multiple of 210 by prime factorization methods. So if I were to uh, see, drag this list over. So the cool thing about Desmos is once you have this table, how I got it was I went insert table you know, and used X sub one. If I just type X one, it'll fill that in. And if I scroll down through here, if I keep pressing enter, then ideally what I'd want here is I want to show the learner that if I enable that line and zoom out a bit, that eventually if I keep populating values, we'll see that we could do this looking at those sequence terms to, to show they do in fact coincide on that line. So saying that that's a place where those three lists intersect and we could go through and by brute force, if we wanted to cast a horizontal for each of these points, we could demonstrate to the learner clearly, well, it might hit two of them, but it doesn't hit all three until this part. Um, so yeah, and in the chat box, again, NCTM principled actions, principled actions, and uh, NCTM catalyzing change. See those great resources. Uh, so there's the first problem. Um, the second problem, I'm going to track all my screens here. There we are. Uh, so track the number of positive multiples. This would be more of a low entry problem um, to kind of get kids thinking the right way with skip count. You know, so we talk about what does the vocabulary word multiples mean? Um, what do we mean by positive? Um, the ordinality of the subtraction matters in this case. You know, so how do we determine which one is the, I forget the term, subtrahend and all that. Um, so let's take a look at, here's something I did on Desmos in problem two. Um, in a similar vein to what you just saw, uh, if we populate these values, you can see, um, do I have to coach kids up a little bit on a what they see, how they be, you know, graphing a function or a sequence or a list of numbers in the appropriate viewing window. So looking on here, we can tell that we can zoom out a bit, scroll around. If I wanted to really put the class down on this, I could specify under you know, projector mode is a little bit nicer in presenting. And if I were to go on here and modify the x-axis to go from zero to say 30, you know, go from zero to say, I don't know, 100 by tens. Um, so we can scroll through here, you know, to determine which of these values the kid's interested in. One thing that I like is I can click on these values and see explicitly which points we're talking about. Um, and then you get into this really cool opportunity for set counting. You know, so I'm counting numbers in a list. If I said, how many numbers are there from six to 10? Well, there's five numbers, but you have to take 10 minus six to get four and then add one back because when you take just the difference, you're counting the number of gaps in between instead of the number of elements in that list. Uh, so there's that example. I also did a similar thing on that problem with Google Sheets. It's what we saw before. You know, and I have kids that problem solve in this way. Um, so they're kids that really like brute force and trial and error. And we don't want to discourage that because we want to use this as an opportunity uh, to cross that chasm of spreadsheet-based logic and say, okay, well, now that you have the list, could you build some, some sort of function in here you know, maybe into a cell or something that would help us count the number of values. Um, you know, so I just want to show that opportunity. And again, you know, the, this is being recorded, so I hope you can appreciate it. I'm just trying to cram as much content in here as I possibly can into one little presentation. So um, are there any questions, observations uh, from the group, anybody really um, regarding any of those two problems? You know, the best part about teaching in this group is it's not like I'm teaching my high schoolers where when we were remote last spring, it was like teaching in the void, you know, black screens of death everywhere. Uh, so at least I can see you guys. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to continue pressing forward and I hope you'll feel comfortable enough just to interrupt. Yeah, actually, I do have one question. All yeah, right. So with the, with the meeting dates, um, do students sort of struggle with figuring out, well, what if they meet 
on January 1st. That might be yes. answering a yes. different question than if they met, you know, somewhere later. Do you, does, mm -hmm. can you pull that information out of any of your tables or is that just a conversation to have afterwards? Yeah, that's something that is a great opportunity for spreadsheet based logic because, you know, if you're including, um, you know, maybe I, I wonder if I could show it on here. Let me, let me run with your question for a minute, Michelle. So if I were to uh, do this in sheets, um, and I was running with that question, you know, the contest we pulled that from uh, is held in November. It's held the first Thursday, in November. So there's this assumption that, you know, what day is it? Well, it's around November 5th. Um, so the answer could change depending upon when this question is posed. So there's an, an understanding of when it's asked, you know, what if I ask it the day after one of these meetings, is it possible we could sneak two of them in? You know, if I put a, a date and time on here, you know, like today is 2-22-2021. And if I pull the fill handle, you know, this, this could lead to a wonderful conversation about um, what kind of logic is driving this date computation. You know, are there, is there something tied into leap years? You know, so if I run this computation for the next 1500 days, uh, will it address that leap year that I'll find one potential error? You know, so there's a lot of wonderful tangential walks we could take with the singular problem with that spreadsheet logic tied in. Um, so yeah, I guess there is an assumption here that I didn't include in the problem and that's you know what, what day it is or what day it's around. Um, and we could tweak the values to make it so there's two meetings a year, or three meetings a year, whatever. Um, so I hope that answers what you're asking, Michelle. I think that's great. Okay. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll press on then. So we talked about skip counting. Um, my own children are skip counting at home. I have kindergarten and third grader. It's wonderful to watch them unravel the mysteries of numeracy. Um, so if we're telling them about skip counting and you know, multiplication, that leads itself into, okay, so how, how do we describe what numbers are and how they work? You know, so I, I pose this question to you and I'll be quiet for just a moment. Uh, but what does it actually mean when we ask kids to combine like terms? You know, what is that? You know, I, th I think we know what it means, um, but I'm not so sure that we know what it means. And I think we sometimes assume that a kid just intuits what like terms mean. Um, sometimes I've heard teachers say things that are separated by plus or minus signs. Um, sometimes I've heard teachers say, well, you need to combine like terms. That means they have the same power of the variable. Well, I can add in a bunch of things that look like a variable. You know, if I start slapping some constants in here, like pi, alpha, beta, maybe some angles, um, all of a sudden that, that muddies the waters a little. You know, so what does combined like terms actually mean? So let's look at, I have an example from graspable math. And if you haven't used graspable math, uh, graspable math interfaces beautifully with GeoGebra. And um, this is what the canvas looks like. I believe it's a University of Indiana construct if memory serves. Um, and what I did was I imported, I put insert math expression and I typed this in. So I went seven X squared, arrowed out of the power plus 18 plus nine X uh, plus 18 X plus 45, I hit done. That's how I get that here. So I'm gonna undo that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a goofy maneuver and I want you to think about <laughs> this, this goofy maneuver is gonna look like it's not, it's accidental, but in fact, it's not purpose. Uh, so let's make a goofy maneuver. So I want you to think for a moment about that. What would you do to coach the kid that made that move? Minimize like, the number of coefficients, I like that. In the chat box, I like that. You know, what is the kid actually doing here? So the interface is beautiful. I'm clicking, you know, I'm single clicking, you know, because I know you can't see my mouse and all that. So I single click, single click, you know. Um, if I hit undo a few times, I can get back to maybe I drag the X around, maybe that's what to do. You know, we would coach the kid to what are we doing here? Well, factoring is division. You know, so combining like terms, and now it's an intuitive move. Um, yeah, you're running the distributed property in reverse. Um, we have to be careful when we say factoring is division. What do we mean? You know, factors are objects we multiply. Uh, but the act of factoring is a verb. You know, think about dividing is how we would show running the distributive law in reverse. Um, you know, another thing that I do quite often with kids is with the starting problem, I would indicate, let's see if I can modify this expression, click here, uh, transform line. So 
So I would modify this expression. Here's something I don't like about graspable math. If I try to slap a one power in there and a zero power in there, I wonder what'll happen. Oh, it did it, how nice. This was not working last night. Okay, so this is what I would do with a kid and say, okay, how do we know which terms are alike? How do we combine them? You know, if I, if I go to divide this off, come on, buddy. I wonder what happens. Oh, that's interesting. Commutativity, oh, nice. Ah, there you are. So, you know, you can drag through here and there's some great tutorials on graspable math. There are 16 of them that reach a minute long. So if you've never used this, you could walk away from this talk right now and you got a great resource. Uh, so you can also insert over here, for example, a graphing interface from GeoGebra. You can do 3D stuff as well and it all embeds down here. So that's graspable math on that third problem. You know, what does combine like terms mean? And then I also have a GeoGebra sheet for the GeoGebra fans out there. Hopefully this loads the way I want it to load. There we are. So I built this construct using f of x note function notation. Um, in hindsight, I really wish I just do this to be get integers and force force the hand here. Step size one, step size one. There you go. So if I drag this around, you can see, you know, ask the kid the question. Oh man, it didn't restrict that. That's no fun. Um, so restricted that my a value just fine. We can say, talk to the kid. Okay, combining like terms here, what effect are these coefficients a and b ha having on the, the shape of the graph? And I'd ask a different question about combine like terms. What does it mean? I can show that I map the graph onto itself if I combine those like terms by factoring out that x. Uh, so in that problem, you know, just thinking about how, how do we carefully describe what combining like these terms means. Um, this adjective noun model comes to us from elementary school. It actually is a, um, it's something I learned about through OGAP, which is the ongoing assessment project from Vermont. It's something we used, Michelle and I were involved with a course years ago for UNL with elementary teachers and teaching math methods to them. Um, and so I had never heard of it before that, that course and doing some of that reading. So the adjective noun model is, comes to us from elementary school and simply says, uh, the, net, the number is the adjective and the variable is the noun. You know, how many, you know, the nine what plus 18 what? You know, nine and 18 serve that function of adjective, whereas the X is the noun. That's helped me a ton, especially when we're doing, you know, if I gusty this stuff a bit, say I throw pi in there, you know, pi is still constant, um, but the noun, the noun is still X and, and the adjective is nine pi and 18 pi. You know? Yes, oh yeah, math is a second language. Um, so now I wanna pause, right here and give you two problems to consider um, that are great middle school problems. Wonderful, the first one's from Math Counts. Uh, the second one is another math bowl question. I forget from what source. So uh, the first one is express five to the 17th, you add all those as power five. And then the second one is, what is the least common denominator of these two fractions You know, with a, with a unit up top? Um, and you have 63 and 56. So I, again, I know I can be, I can come off too strong if I just blitz through this. So I'm gonna pause here for a minute, give you some time to ponder before I show you, you know, how I approach this um, using technology. I'm gonna put that uh, OGAP, the ongoing uh, assessment project. It was Vermont, I'm gonna look that up. You know, so maybe you're having a, a math teacher reaction. Um, anybody, anybody in here have some thoughts on what to try on example four, like what you might do to approach that problem? Uh, I would remind them that repeated addition is the same as multiplication. Um, so you could recognize that um, it's the same thing as five to the 17 times five. And then you just have to remind them that expo exponents are the same as repeated multiplication. Very good, I'll echo that. Um, you know, and I'll include this in the chat box too. If you haven't looked up MAA, Mathematical Association of America's uh, 10 problem solving strategies. So the, the, ma the mathematician involved with all that is James Tanton. Uh, he does a lot of stuff for MMA through curriculum inspirations. 
so he has 10 suggested problem solving strategies that if we um, if, our, if our learners don't know how to behave when they don't know what to do well the mathematics is full of those opportunities where you've got to figure out what to do or what to try um, so one strategy we might employ here would be if we're going with that repeated addition we might look at each of these terms and say can i can I remove some of the complexity? Can I get rid of the five to the 17th and instead make it A or B or something? You know, if I have A plus A plus A plus A plus A plus A, and stare at that for a minute and think about, can I craft a similar, smaller version of the problem? Um, how about the second problem? You know, what to try on here? You know, for the, I'm thinking of our, our sixth grade and seventh grade learners. You know, for some, in some cases, I've, I'm working with fifth graders. Um, so I'm thinking about them and the experience that they have. What, would, what might you say to a kid? Who's trying to uh, figure out this common denominator process? You know, wait time sometimes a lost art, you know. And if you're like me and been teaching all day, it's kind of tough. Um, I wonder about how the kid views sixty three and fifty six. You know, I wonder about, do they know to split them apart or what, what might they do? Um, so again, I have some visuals uh, created at the ready, I hope. There we go, so let's get that spreadsheet out of there. Um, and again, this is on the Padlet. So looking at, what, we're, what are we on here? Uh, example four. So an example four, let's start with the decimal sheet I constructed. Um, so we're looking at, I tried to do this using sliders. And what's fun here is a great opportunity for scientific notation. We get a number that, let's see, 10 to the six is a million, 10 to the ninth is a billion, 10 to the 12 be a trillion. So we get a number just south of four trillion when we add these together. And I tried crafting an expression with differences in powers, where A is the slider value. I'm trying to deduct that. And you can notice it's not very, it's kind of anticlimactic. Um, I did try desperately earlier with the high scores. Like, what happens when you set the window to see that? I was like, I have no idea, let's find out. So how about we go y-axis of 0.8 times 10 to the 12? Sorry, buddy, the 12. And then his friend, uh, four times 10 to the 12. And a step size, I don't know, how about uh, 10 to the 11? Why not? And notice, I, I don't see anything. I'm looking at this and there's not any colored bubbles here. Um, my kids that are Desmos addicts, they would look at this and go, I don't know what to do. Um, so let's talk about the, another approach. Let's use GeoGebrance to see if we can see anything from that. And this sheet is the one I'm the most proud of from the set of stuff I prepared for this presentation. Um, so there's a lot going on here. You can get under the hood, download the sheet, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, I created some dynamic text boxes here that'll update as I increment slider A. So I'm going to very silently just uh, increment this, have you take a look at what's going on in the sheet. So something very interesting happens. Uh, I, have, I have a bit of a LaTeX scripting error there. Um, something interesting happens when we start out with taking out a factor of five and a factor of five to the second, five to the third, and so on. And then we get to five to the 17th and look at that. Oh, that's weird. Oh, yes. Um, so if you wanted to crack this open, look under the hood and all that stuff, how I made this, if I right click or if you're using a Chromebook two finger click with the settings, uh, you can find under text, you can see how I built that. Um, that LaTeX thing uh, to insert those C's, those objects that are in the sheet, you would click on this little GeoGebra icon and it'll point to anything that appears in the algebra window. You know, so that's something for you to pick apart later. Um, one thing I want to point out though is this, this red line, this blue line. So the red line vanishes after we increment the slider. You know, so the red line is representing five to the A. So five to the, five to the first, it's five, it's right there. Uh, five to the second, all of a sudden it's 25, it's off the screen. But then this blue line represents a function that's a hybrid. It's the composition of um, take your GX term, which is this thing, and then subtract off the numeric evaluation of it. And notice that um, there's an interesting conversation you have with your, with your kiddos about why that blue line is flat, scraping the x-axis and can't get off of it. Okay, so there's that there. Um, the graspable math sheet is super cool. This is super cool. So I've got that's a very simple expression, you know, insert math expression. And then I can start um, tugging on things here, start moving around what happens when I combine a couple of them, when I combine three of them. Um, you can see what happens there if I start dragging powers around, clicking to evaluate. 
know, if I want to show the intermediate steps, I can pull this down using this little pull handle here. Um, undo to all that stuff. I can undo, back it up. You know, what happens when I only do two of them? Uh, what happens when I pull one of these fives? What was I doing earlier? Pull 17 off. Can I get that to come down? No, oh, it won't, it won't do a lot. Okay. So you can see that there. And then this fifth problem, this least common denominator thing. Um, great opportunity for your contest kids, your higher level kids. If you're looking for a differentiation opportunity, kids that next year they don't know to do this. Um, stick them on an elementary problem, especially for action based learning, and I watch them squirm a little bit. So, this is a great resource called Mathagon. If any of you haven't heard of Mathagon, you need to go there, mathagon.org. Um, this is an evolving resource. Some of you may have heard of it. There's a bunch of stuff on here. Um, so one thing that I've got my kindergartner doing at home, you know, not that I have any of the answers, but my son Emmett just is addicted to multiplication by heart. So put on play. Um, my five-year-old can come in here and uh, rep to his little heart's content each of these groupings. So what I really like is it changes the groupings. Uh, he can do skip counting. So he's sitting there going, okay, five times three, he's going three, six times, you know, skip counting. Um, you can go in here, get practice, give you medals and all sorts of other stuff. Come back up here to activities. Um, the one thing I was working on is polypad. So if you're needing in need of virtual manipulatives, this is a wonderful place to go. I pulled these fraction bars from over here, but there's a whole gob of things on here. Um, as a math teacher, it's like a kid in a candy store. Um, you know, so I was pulling like one seventh and one eighth. Uh, fraction bars, and then I was staring at this going, okay, so if I was solving this problem rigorously, you know, I would line these three fraction bars up and I'd start slicing the heck out of this. And in fact, I would cut it 503 times, literally. Um, another thing to play with while, while we're here, Mathagon, uh, the timeline of mathematics is super cool. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for opportunities for, um, you know, showing that not all mathematicians are white Europeans, uh, showing that there are lots of opportunities throughout human history where math is being done in lots of different places. Uh, it's not an exhaustive timeline, but it's got some great opportunities here. I was looking at the first one from classical antiquity, uh, Thales. So I'll open up Thales theorem here, um, scroll down a bit. You know, it gives me this nice thing. It gives you this little feedback. Uh, my son loves it. When you get questions right, this little fox sometimes turns into, into gifts or memes, you know. Um, if I do these, there's some interactive um, constructs here that, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing law of tails, start by picking two points anywhere in the box on the left. Okay, two points. Craft the semicircle. Pick a third point that lies somewhere in the circumference. Look at that. Drag the point around and look what you got. So there's all sorts of cool stuff on here. You can spend hours and hours. I haven't even explored all the things. Um, but I was trying to do this least common denominator thing. I would especially look at it as an opportunity to talk about greatest common divisor and least common multiple. Um, so let me get two things queued up. The first is if you're not using art problem solving, you need to. Uh, Looks like we team. have a question, Shelby, about if Mathagon works on iPads. Um, I assume that it does because there's tactile things there. I'm not sure whether it's running JavaScript, what the background the answer is. I don't know. I've never tried it, but I would assume that it probably does. In fact, I might even go home and try it later on tonight with my kid. Um, so I, I don't know. I know that it works well on Chromebooks. I've seen kids use that. I know that it works well on um, PC. Okay. And sorry, I was on a tirade. And I'll, I'll start, you get me going and I, it's just giving candy. Um, so on art of problem solving, it's been very encouraging that art of problem solving has stepped in due to COVID and they're, they're, um, they are curating all of the math counts competitions. Um, something that I've used for years that we can't get enough kids' hands is your kids need to be on Apple. You know, if you're looking for a differentiation opportunity, you can give your kids uh, keys to the car and let them go, let them go drive around. Um, so if I go to play, um, change focus. One thing I have my middle schoolers doing, so a lot of people ask, you know, how are you building that middle school program out there? Um, having kids work through pre-algebra. And then the next thing I have them do is go to number theory. You know, number, Gauss once said number theory is the queen of mathematics, right? Mathematics is the queen of all the sciences and number theory is the queen of mathematics. So we want kids to have really good understanding of what a multiple is, a divisor, what a GCD is, Euclidean algorithm, uh, bases and mods. Uh, so 
if you're looking for a resource to allow your kids um, to kind of play and explore, let's go to LCM and GC problem solving. So that you focus, take a look. Uh, so if you haven't used this before, with these common multiple 135 and 468, you know, we can decompose that. I'm going to guess 13. I'm going to get it wrong. Um, there's a five in there. It looks like three. Uh, I don't know. I'll just make something up. I'm guessing. I don't know. Uh, 12. Uh, you get it wrong twice, and it'll show you a methodology. It gives you an answer. Um, as a teacher, there's some great tools in here. I can click on teacher tools, and I can go through the kid's problem stream. The kid says, man, I was stuck on this topic. I don't know what to do. Um, I can have the kid screenshot that problem, send it to me. Um, this has been a really robust platform. It's free for us to use. All a kid needs to have is an email address. Um, if they're under the age of 13, then what they would need to do is have a parent guardian fill out a, a permission form that's on the site and print it, uh, sign it, scan it, send it to them, and then they're good to go. Um, so that's a wonderful resource for LCM GCD. You know, but what if I'm doing this problem the old-fashioned way? Hand. Um, so if you compose 63 into the product 9 and 7, and 56 into the product of you know 8 and 7, and then I'm a big fan of writing things out silently without commenting. So I know we've been focusing on language a little bit, the adjective now, adjective now model, but I want to write things out because in human history, all of mankind has tried desperately to make a, a computing device that rivals the thing between a kid's ears. Um, and I know that I, the kids can see the patterns. They can figure it out without my intervention if I shine the light in the right direction. So what I would do is I'd, I'd write out these two prime factorizations and I'd say, okay, kid, I'm gonna write it in a goofy way. And I wanna tell them why. Then we might use that brute force reasoning. You know, what if I make a, a spreadsheet with, with uh, multiples of 63? What if I make a spreadsheet with multiples of 56? And I think I even did that. Um, Memory serves. I think I got something rocked in here. Here it is. I see this uh, screenshot there. I go to graphical math. This might not be it. Oh yeah, here's here's the graphical math problem worked out that I showed. You know, each of these you know ratios, the scaling here, and so on. You know, one thing I like about this is I can interact, get this to do some careful addition, careful multiplication, and then this is the part I don't like. Try to double tap. Oh, terrifying. I don't want that. No, thank you. Uh, let's do it that way. Um, what if I go to Desmo? This is what I was thinking of. Clean up some tab. Go. Um, so here I am, skip counting by 56s, skip counting by 63s. If we discover that the answer is 504, at least come multiple between the two. You know, 504, if I write out its prime factorization, you know, what is 504? Well, I know it's two times 252. And we can keep working on it and working on it. Uh, two times 128, nope, 126. Ah, yes, there it is. Uh, nine times, oh, what is that? Nine, 30, 14. And so all of a sudden we get uh, two, two times two times three times three times two times seven. So now we have. Uh, two cubed times three squared times seven to the first. And so I'm looking at this going, okay, how do I relate these two representations? And that, well, that may be evident to a room full of math teachers. That's certainly not evident um, to the learner that may not think to employ this strategy in particular. There might be a reason why this pattern would be useful. You know, um, this strategy comes to, comes to mind for me because I teach math counts contest problems where we're talking about, um, if I take the GCD of two numbers and the LCM of two numbers and I multiply that, I get the product of the original two numbers for this counting reason. Um, so you know, if we want our learners to, um, to thrive uh, when it comes to factoring, we wouldn't have a really great underlying base of number sense coming out of middle school. We don't wanna accelerate and skip past the fractional proportional reason they really need to have their ratios. Um, but if you're looking to supplement, help get your, you know, I'm, I'm at the high school level. You know, I'm looking for ways to remediate. How do I get the kid a grade level skill in Algebra 2 class if he or she doesn't have a good conception of what a multiple is? Um, 
that's where I think one of the most valuable resources you could use would be exploding dots. Uh, exploding dots. So exploding dots um, clear up a lot of things, right? As Rain, I've been present every presentation I give, I talk about exploding dots. Um, exploding dots is something from James Tanton. Uh, there are islands to work through. Uh, this has been done by millions of kids all over the all over the world. Uh, James has some great YouTube videos. Has a lot of passion and excitement uh, for the discipline. If you work through the first six islands of content, um, you'll notice I do know work. This works on iPads as well as on Chromebooks. Touch screens. Um, if I scroll through here, it's the one to two machine, two to one machine rather. Um, there's an example YouTube video, and then all of a sudden we can say put two dots in the right most box of the machine. Okay, pop, pop. Um, continue, and then it works me through. This is this is by far the most effective way to teach basal arithmetic. So if you're talking about you know, what happens in binary, what happens in tertiary, base eight, base 16, and so on. Um, the sixth island corresponds incredibly well with polynomial division in algebra two. So if you've got a kid who is just wrestling fiercely with polynomial division, then boy, do I have a free product for you right here. Have them work through these islands and then it'll all make sense to them in terms of sliding place values you know, and factoring. Thinking about like, how do I know if I'm, um, you know, how do, how do I know if I want to take the rational expression 5x cubed plus uh, 3x, and then I want to divide that by x minus 2, you know, how do I know there has to be a place value here for x squared? How do I know that? You know, and the exploding dots will do a great job of helping the kids understand, you know, you explode, you have an overload, and then shifting um, explains a lot of your um, subtraction and addition regrouping issues in terms of place value and operations. So just a, it's a wonderful interface. Kids can use trial and error to, to learn with. So I certainly encourage you to check that out. Exploding dots. Um, so let's make sure it's the topic because you get lost in the, in the wash. Um, so the time we have left, I want to talk about Nix the Tricks. And so this is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Um, I tell my kids over here, I've got cancel is a cuss word in my classroom. Cancel is horribly imprecise, you know, and, and I, and I know that there is a time and a place for using that, that term cancel and that there are professionals and adults that do. But I want them to think about the stigma associated with language. The moment I say cancel, conceptually, a kid thinks of zero. You know, so if I'm canceling things in the top and bottom, we shouldn't be surprised in algebra when all of a sudden factors mysteriously vanish and everything goes to nothing. Um, so I coach my kids up to say the ratio of a number to itself is one. Every time we look for those ratios of one, the ratio of a number to itself is one. Um, same thing with solving equations. When we say that two additive opposites cancel, you know, it's imprecise. When I say additive opposites sum to zero, we want to use the language of mathematics. And so if you're unfamiliar with Nix the Tricks, Nix the Tricks is a PDF that you can find online for free. Um, it's a collection of efforts from the Bit Boss and the Math Teacher Blogosphere on Twitter. Uh, so if I search up Nix the Tricks Volume 2, it comes up with this PDF. Nix the Tricks. There we go. So that's, that's how I got there. Um, Nix the tricks is something we spent time on in PLC. So it's about getting rid of shortcuts, showing why they lead to misconceptions or gaps. And then what we should be doing instead with our presentation in class, what we should be doing instead with language we use with kids. So for example, um, on here I have my mathematical hit list. These are things that I wish we could just strike from I wish we could just strike this for the discipline right now. First of all, is the four letter F of FOIL. FOIL refers to such a small set of multiplication problems that it is, it is a waste of time to teach. Instead, we should just, just be saying distribute. And that's one of the things featured in Mix the Tricks. Um, PEMDAS, the butterfly method, the Jesus fish. Uh, these are a whole bunch of things that some of these tricks I had never even heard of. Um, but there's some great action in here to help the math teacher think about, okay, is what I'm, is what I'm presenting to the kid, if I'm in, introducing a shortcut, am I unintentionally harming them in the long term in terms of development? Um, so I want to jump down to group, you know, order of operations I have a big beef with. You know, PEMDAS, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, all that stuff. Um, there are a, a gob of grouping symbols that are not parentheses. Think about it. We have fraction bar, square root, um, cube root, absolute value. Um, so you can see on here, 
uh, where is it? There it is, Nix. So the real thing I really like about this PDF, it says, get rid of this trick because. It gives a reason. Um, you see on social media sprinkled throughout Facebook, these come up all the time. 90% of the people get this quiz wrong. And it always has some permutation of division appearing to the left of multiplication. And then people do it inadvertently wrong because of the order of operations. Um, so what we want to say instead is Gemma. Keep it simple. Grouping symbols, exponents, multiply and add. Well, divisions, fancy multiplication, and, and subtractions, fancy addition. That's it. So this is a wonderful thing. Your, your PLC has enough fodder in this to go out and, and spend a couple of years um, improving the things that you're doing with your kids. So make sure you check that out. It's the tricks. Um, jailbreak radicals appears in there. Square root and can't square cancel. You know, one of my one of my pet peeves in Calc BC and Calc and Calc AP when I've taught it is this. So I, I present that to the room for your consideration. What's that? You know, the one thing I'd say is by formal definition, that's the absolute value of X. This one causes a whole slew of problems. We were doing a, a question a couple of days ago on polar coordinates in Calc BC, and we were getting all sorts of stuff wrong because we weren't addressing this case. You know, five squared is 25. Negative five multiplied by itself is 25. If we're driving that car in reverse, there's two different ways to arrive at that result. You know, so graphing it out on number line, saying here's zero, here's X, here's negative X, show that absolute value. That's the topic of maybe step factoring. So the next problem I have for your consideration takes a vertical view of, as a, as a teacher of calculus, what do I wish the algebra teachers were doing in those algebra one and algebra two classes? What, what do I wish they were emphasizing? Um, one of which would be this first, uh, this first example, which seems counterintuitive. Uh, so if I sent you out on this hunt and said factor two X minus 11, what would you do? So, you know, you might even look at it and say, that's prime, right? 2x minus 11, uh, searching for a greatest common divisor, greatest common factor, 2 and 11 are relatively prime, they're co-prime, their GCD is one. Uh, x to the first and x to the zero. Uh, we, we like to remind our calculus students that when we're faced with a choice of factoring variables, like here, we would choose to factor out the lowest power of the variable, you know, as a reminder. Um, so what I would say is this factor 2x minus 11 task may seem mundane, but allow me to present some evidence to you to suggest otherwise. That might actually um, throw a wrench into a kid's understanding of limits, a kid's understanding of rational expressions. Um, so we say to the kid, that's not factorable. What does that even mean? I can rewrite that as the product of, of several things. Um, so let's look at example six. I have this handy sheet on Desmos I constructed. Um, I use Desmos as an open teaching tool all the time. And if you want to have commentary over here on the side, like I can actually use this and type line by line, go up here to add and add a note. And then I can just start typing. So if I want to have the kid open up a sheet that has like notes and commentary, we can just do that. Um, but I've, I've meant to hide all those factorizations. Isn't that lovely? Uh, so you see, I have a folder here. The way I got that was I went to enter the folder. And then notice there's this like hidden gray bar here. I can drag these objects in and out of that folder by controlling it with that bar. So down here, I have a, a litany of factorizations. They're all valid. Um, for example, if I factored the two out, the question I have for you is, do I get an expression, a graph that would be the same as the red graph? You know, I think we're getting to it, yeah. Um, in fact, this one might have some general meaning, negative 11 halves. Oh yeah, there, there he is right there, five halves or 11 halves. But what about the second factorization? What's the meaning of this? You can factor an X out. When you redistribute, you'll get the same result. But all of a sudden, we've unintentionally introduced this domain and range issue. So anytime we divide by X, we don't know its value, we need to consider, are we unintentionally introducing something bad? And this is where you have to coach your kids a bit to use the technology because the technology will not reveal this issue unless you know something. So if I hide that and I look at this red graph and I click on it and I drag this point around, notice that all of these points are defined because we know the domain and range of a linear function of polynomial are all real numbers. But if I were to 
ask, is the green or the blue graph equivalent to the red one? And most kids, they'll, they'll click on it and go, oh yeah, they're the same. But I pose to you what would happen if, um, if I compare the red graph with the green one. At first glance, they appear to be the same. But if I know something, I know there's gonna be a trouble in this neighborhood. So I'm gonna click on this graph and start marching towards X is zero. And all of a sudden we have unintentionally <gasps> introduced a problem. So these factorizations are useful. In fact, when we're coaching kids on the, the, the process of polynomial or synthetic division as it's called, you know, even in the mix of tricks, I say don't use synthetic. Um, all of these different factorizations have a meaning. They all generate the original equation, but when we're doing these problems with limits and calc in particular, we sometimes introduce these issues unintentionally uh, without being able to detect them without some coaching. Um, so, whoops, did not mean to do that. So I always keep it back up. There we go. So where did I leave off? Right here. Uh, so going into this idea of, you know, I wanna coach the kid to factor out the, high, the lowest power of X. And if you haven't taught anything like pre-calc on up, um, let's talk about why that's true. When we're applying repeated derivatives, um, it's usually best practice to factor the expression to try to avoid some work later on. Um, so I want to call up example seven, I'll show you what I did in Desmos. Um, so that's this factoring problem here, factor this, uh, oh, this nasty creature with X's and, and powers that are rational expressions. Um, Try again, bud. No, it's a copy paste issue, the link there. Um, what I wanted to show here, sorry for the screen switching. My, my wife sometimes complains that I, I switch the screens too quickly, she gets nauseous. Um, so if I'm going to factor this uh, GCD between 35 and 14 is seven, uh, oops, seven. GCD between X to the seven fifths and X to the negative three fourths. I want to factor out that lowest power of X. And then I tell my kids, coach them again and again, factor these division. So if I want to know what goes in the interior here, if I run the distributive law in reverse, I would need to show this division. And then we can revisit those nice algebraic properties, like what happens when um, you are taking the uh, ratio of a variable that's expressed to a power. You know, what do we follow there and what do we write down here? Um, furthermore, so in the same vein, uh, we often tell kids, you know, when you're factoring, kid says to you, how do I know when to stop? And then we say, okay, well, you know when to stop when it's like X plus something or X minus something. But really we treat those linear quantities as primes because that's the most conservative approach. So I have this you know, classic fact, you know, quadratic trinomial to factor, factor X squared plus five X plus six. Uh, so I have a graspable math sheet here uh, to show you. And so I've, I've done a bunch of doodling on this sheet. Um, I've, I've also included a GeoGebra graph to interfaces. I don't have this dynamic tied. So you could very well import the function and get this thing to match up. You see, I have the roots shown here, uh, the factoring by association. Uh, we have two linear binomials, which if I don't know the value of X, if I assume I'm just restricting this to integers, um, if I know the value of x, x plus three could be prime or composite. So since I don't know its value, I need to take the more conservative approach. The more conservative approach would be to treat it as prime. So that's how we know when to stop is when the factors are prime. Um, the second example drives that point home. Factor two x squared minus 14 x uh, minus 16. So I wrote that out earlier because I knew I would be pressed for time at the end. So here's that two x squared minus four x minus 16. If I factor out the GCD of two and then operate on that resulting trinomial, I generate a prime factorization, two X minus four and X plus two, which if we think about number theory, um, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says that every integer has a unique prime factorization, a positive integer. Uh, so this would be the prime factorization of this particular value. However, if I don't pull the two out of there, I could potentially take this two, this is what I did, and I distributed it to the X plus two, and got this, or I could take that two distributed to x minus four factor and get this, and I could get two different factorizations. It still have meaning. It still corresponds to the original trinomial, but they're not the prime factorization. 
You know, so when we talk about factoring, we want to make sure that we're coaching our kids using the language of number theory. How do you know, how do I know when to stop factoring? I know to stop factoring when, I, when the results are prime factors. How do I know when I, when I stop dividing in algebra two? You know, I've had a kid ask you this question before. Um, let's generate one off the cuff. X squared plus five X divided by X minus three. You know, kid ends up with the result here. What times X generates eight X? Distribute, additive opposites. Now the question becomes, what goes here? Kid says, I don't know when to stop. Well, think about it. We said, how many groupings of X are in eight X? Well, there's eight of those. How many groupings of X are in 24? What mystery number multiplied by X would result in 24? Well, think about it. We need a ratio of one here to, to get rid of that X. We would need 24 in the numerator. How do we know when to stop? This is a rational function. It's no longer polynomial. We're dividing by x. This is an x to the minus one power. Over here, this was an x to the zero power. That's how we knew when to stop. So I encourage, I encourage you to consider um, how your words have power and how everything you say, the kid's gonna hang on every word, especially if they're struggling, because they might unintentionally glean something that you didn't mean to say. So you know, as we, as we draw this presentation close to a close, you know, I, will, I want you to consider the power of words and how all of your background in language arts is immediately applicable in math class. Um, you know, factoring is possible without integers. I can't stress this enough. You know, how do I factor this two-term expression? I have to consider some things that aren't integers. Um, this is a great problem from the Phillips Exeter problem set that I have here. Um, the Phillips, Phillips Exeter problem sets are publicly available online. Uh, Phillips Exeter is a school on the East Coast. One of my former students is attending there. Um, and so they've had, had these wonderful problem sets uh, that we use as take-home examples. It's a great place, a great source to go get some wonderful, really rich, really deep problems. Um, so this problem, uh, where is it? Where did it go? It's for what values of x does root 45 equal root 5 plus root x? Root 45 equal root 5 plus root x have that worked out here. So, you know, if you were to work that problem out, this is a great opportunity to, again, teach mind-like terms. You know, in this particular step, if I decompose root 45 into the product of three and root five, and then try to solve the statement for X, I would need to isolate X by subtracting root five from both sides. And then I say, okay, how do I combine three cookies minus one cookies, two cookies? Well, that's all fine and good. The kid says, what are the cookies? Okay, kid. I noticed root five is the common factor. I factored it out. The resulting difference here was two. Two root five equals X. And then we can, I love this problem because it allows us to think about, okay, instead of trying to start with root 20 and march towards simplified radical, what if we run this in reverse? And say, how did we arrive at 20 in the first place? You know, just a really rich, rich investigation. Um, and then I've got a couple of things here at the end that you know you can take time looking at. Uh, one of which is this strategy of what does the test, what is what does ACT and SAT hope for us in factoring? Well, they want us to have these, you know, conversations about how many terms and potential uh, factoring strategies and these sorts of things. But ultimately, um, I would rewind the tape and say, what about GCDs and LCMs? What about proportional reasoning, what about ratios? And what about that really cool middle school stuff that we often just blast kids past? Um, the parting shots I would have here, you know, not get into that problem. Uh, first of all, the word simplify. So coming back to, you know, why does why do I say cancels a cusp in my class? Um, in this particular rational expression, you notice that if you factor four out of the denominator, you'd end up wiping everything away. You know, so the kid comes in here to Desmos and says, "Wait a minute, uh, type in. Let's learn together. Sure, why not?" f of x equals ratio, and I want eight minus x, eight minus x over 32 minus four x. And says, Mr. Aubrey, why did I get a constant? Why is the value always a fourth? The ratio of a number to itself is one. So if I say to the kid, okay, let's do one quantity eight minus x, or four quantity eight minus x, 
and let them intuit why it is that this thing always equals a four. And however, why is it that this, the, the technology doesn't detect this issue at eight? You know, eight put, imposes this domain issue. I can find it, there he is, undefined. The last thing I'll leave you with is open middle. Um, yes, there'll be, Dan, there'll be a link to this PowerPoint. It's actually uh, all included on the Padlet. I'll throw it over here on the left at the end. So you can just go to the Padlet. Um, the last thing here is open middle. If you haven't been looking at um, open middle, factoring quadratics, uh, there's a whole litany of things on there that Robert Komplinski, Bob Komplinski has, um, that are tasks that, you know, for example, fill in the blanks with integers, so the quadratic expression is factorable. Um, if I look at that open middle problem that I did on GeoGebra, you know, I, I set this quadratic and said, okay, well, how do I, how do I make sure it's factorable? Well, I built some logic in here that if I have the slider controlling that integer in the middle, you can see that I show where the roots are non-existent, where the roots are integers, and where the roots are irrational. So I warned you earlier, I had way more content that I could fit in this presentation, but it can all be yours. Um, I'll make sure that the, the links to everything are on this Padlet. So you know, I'll throw the Padlet link in there one more time. That's in the chat box for your enjoyment. Uh, so what you'll see is I'll throw the graphics and solutions. The Google Doc is there with all the links. Those are publicly available for free for you to mess with. Uh, the presentation itself, I'll put another entry here where you'll have that those set of slides. And if you want to email me, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, if you have questions about what I did here, follow me on Twitter. That'd be wonderful too. I'm two minutes over time. I apologize infinitely. Uh, so I'll go ahead and be quiet. Thank you so much for the opportunity tonight and we'll entertain questions. Thanks. If anybody's still here. <laughs> yes, thank you, Shelby. So maybe we can put our little claps right? Or a clap for <laughs> or thumbs up. Yes, thanks. Um, are there any, anyone need to ask any questions? So the, the important links are there. I know I've already copied them down on a separate page for myself. Um, and just, just to, just to follow up, I really wasn't even prepared to, to introduce Shelby, but he really is a, one of the Nebraska all-stars if you kind of, he's quite highly decorated, right? A presidential award winner, um, a Nebraska teacher of the year. Were you a rookie of the year also way back yeah. when? I thought oh, yeah. you, way back in the day. Yeah. I was, I was around. Yeah. So <laughs> a national cert board certified. So yeah, he definitely fits our all-star lineup. And you can tell by the all the information that he shares too. So um, I don't see any questions. Stephanie, did I use any that I missed? No, just lots of thanks, I think. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and please share this information far and wide, you know, and if there's something that I didn't do a good job explaining, you know, I'd love to respond to email. Um, you know, my hope is that we can um, grow the level of mathematical rigor in our state you know, and so I saw I saw some wonderful representation across eastern Nebraska, all across our state that we're here tonight. And also, if you could share this, you know, start having those conversations about, you know, how does our language impact what learners are thinking in the math classroom? That would be great. So thanks again for the opportunity. Okay, thank you.